Jordan River. You reveal that you are consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds and our hearts on this day of your great epiphany. Make us holy by the indwelling of your Spirit and make us worthy to celebrate this festival of lights so that we may glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the one Father whose voice came from heaven, testifying to his beloved Son, and to the only begotten Son, who is worshipped, whose light radiated upon the river, and who accepted baptism from John his forerunner, and to the one only Spirit, who descended and appeared above the head of the sun. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. The earth rejoices in your epiphany, O Son of God, and the peoples and nations shout for joy on this day of your baptism. You dawn from the Father and have sanctified baptism for us. O Church of the nations, proclaim the glory of the Son of God, who became man who was baptized for your sake in the Jordan River, and cry out to him, Blessed are you, O Christ, O Word of God. You willingly emptied yourself and took the form of a man. You gave us a pledge of life in the waters of baptism, making us holy and heirs of your kingdom. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to sanctify us through this great epiphany. Create a new heart within us. Make us newborn children of your Father and pour out forgiveness upon your flock that we may worship you, glorify your Father, and give thanks to your Holy Spirit forever.
O Christ, word of the heavenly Father, you became man for our sake, and you were baptized in the Jordan River. You became the way and the door that leads us to the Father. Grant us your grace and mercy and accept the fragrance of our incense, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. <clears throat> Hallo kodi shat hail to no kodi shat lo mahoyu to shi ho det amed men you hano Waters have been truly blessed. All on earth be attentive. Waters have been sanctified. Lord our God, you accepted what the just had offered you. Now accept in your mercy our pure sacrifice. reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, now I myself, Paul, urge you through the gentleness and clemency of Christ I, who am humble when face to face with you, but brave toward you when absent, I beg you that, when present, I may not have to be brave with the confidence that which I intend to act boldly against some who consider us acting according to the flesh. For although we are in the flesh, we do not battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our battle are not of flesh, but are enormously powerful, capable of destroying fortresses. We destroy arguments and every pretension, raising itself against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. And we are ready to punish every disobedience once your obedience is complete. Look at what confronts you. Whoever is confident 
of belonging to Christ should consider that he belongs to Christ, and so do we. And even if I should boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not tearing you down, I shall not be put to shame. May I not seem as one frightening you through letters, for someone will say his letters are severe and forceful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Such a person must understand that what we are in word through letters when absent that we also are in action when present. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle John writes, the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me who ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. And I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. And John testified further, saying, I saw this spirit come down like a dove from the sky and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, Upon whomever you see the spirit come down and remain, he is the one who shall baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen, and I have testified that this is the Son of God. This is the truth, peace be with you. Now I have seen, and I have testified that this is the Son of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This gospel is the very first chapter of St. John, and it's a cascade of light. And as always, I encourage you to go back and read the entire chapter. 
The first 18 lines are the very famous opening of the word. The word was with God and the word was God. It's a cascade of light because we see here completely portrayed by the motion of grace, God's initiative. God appears in the world. The second section is the gospel we have today of St. John's testimony. And then we have St. John having his disciples go off to follow our Lord. And among those disciples, they contact others. And by the end of the chapter, you have the first five disciples. First, are we going to be five of the apostles? So it's a cascade of light with God's initiative. And the thing during the season of Denho, the importance of it is this rising. And what we can consider today is that the gospel is a message. I mean, the very word itself, good tidings. We tend to use good news, but these tidings, it's a good announcement which is given. And just simply in the Old English, spell means a word or something which is spoken. So God's spell was literally the good announcement, the good word that was being given. But by its very essence, the gospel is precisely that. It's a message, something that is relayed, something that is received, something that is given. So St. John's testimony that we have in the gospel today, he's telling you, God has led me in this path. I didn't know who this individual was going to be, who the Messiah was, but I had been told that the one upon whom the Spirit descends, this is, I give you now testimony. I have seen this myself, I have received this, and I communicate this to you. For the gospel to be fruitful, it requires of us both to receive it and to communicate it. To receive it and to hold it on like it's mine falsifies the gospel. It's a communication. And you see it towards the end of this gospel, the first chapter of St. John, because you have Andrew and John. Andrew gets his brother Simon. Then they have Philip. And Philip goes and gets Nathaniel. So you have the individuals who are receiving, who hear, and who communicate. It's a funny thing how we live in a culture in which everything's about sharing. Share, 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 share. We even have a cliche. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> We're constantly sending things off to people. Share, share, share. We, for we forward them off all the time. Link, 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 link. We do this all the time. But I already warn you, if you do that with me and you don't tell me why you're sending the link, it's just delete. I'm not going to open it. I'm not going to, if you can't even have the time to actually tell what's going on, then it's unimportant. It's a knee-jerk reaction. You go, oh, I'll send this out, like to everybody. And we spend culturally all of this doing and doing and doing, and yet we live in a culture which is so falsified and perverse that while we share everything, we're all supposed to just like spill our guts and emotion and make public repentance on television, everything. We do not share the gospel. We share everything except the very thing in creation which is meant to be shared, which is the gospel of Christ. The very message of that cascade of light that comes down from the word. And the word was made flesh. Now in part we do it because it's hard. We're told in the very first lines, when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, he came among his own and his own did not receive him. It's hard. The message isn't that it's easy. But it is life-giving. And that aspect of communication and sharing is so profoundly important. But we're told with Christ himself, with the word made flesh, that he came among his own, that he came among Israel, that he came among his creation. There's actually two aspects of this. One, the word coming in amongst those that he had created. The darkness does not overtake it. It is not received. But also the people that he created, Israel, they do not receive him. But then we see with the testimony of John, and that's the pivotal part of this chapter one. St. John talks about the fact that it's not always clear, the message. I didn't know who the Messiah was to be. So he makes that clear. There's always going to be some obscurity because we're human. The infinite radiance of God is always going to be received according to my little puny brain. And therefore, needless to say, the infinitely luminous one the message that is given to me is always going to be obscured by some way just by my reception of it. But that's not bad, it's just the way things are. 
But so St. John is talking about that obscurity of not knowing who the individual is, but then when he realizes that by the coming of the Spirit upon this individual, that this is the Son of God. That is the testimony that John gives. I have seen and now I give witness, now I communicate to you. And so St. John the Evangelist is part of this whole process. He doesn't name himself. He talks about two disciples and he names one Andrew, but he doesn't name the other one, which is why from the beginning it's always been considered John never gives his name, but clearly the recountings in his, this fourth, fourth gospel are personal experiences. And so the person that's not named, if he's named in any way, it's actually by a phrase, the disciple that Jesus loved. And that's just simply the way it's phrased. But again, it's considered to be John. So John will be part of bringing his brother James in. Andrew is part of bringing Simon in. And you wind up having this communication that takes place easy, uh, immediately. So St. John's testimony, which is in the beginning of this, John the forerunner, John the Baptist, Baptist John's testimony is giving both the obscurity and the need to communicate, to pass this message on. And as I said, the gospel is such in a way that by our sharing of it brings life to us. This communication that takes place not only is received by me for me to flourish and be healed, but also by communicating also continues that light. And therefore with all of spiritual goods, the more that they are shared, the more that we are enriched. With material things, it's completely opposite. You can only share your bank account so much. You can only share your food to, so, to a certain extent because materiality means they're very limited by the fact that they are material things, stuff of this earth. But the spiritual things, the person who is good, the person who desires to pursue virtue and goodness has an impact upon other people's lives also to become good. We all know someone in our life who, as we were growing up, were very kind or gave us consideration or stopped for a moment. Everyone has a story of a teacher or even perhaps a boss, somebody who took a concern and helped us move in those early years when we didn't have the ability to do it ourselves. And because of that, goodness always radiates outward. And the epitome in this first chapter of St. John that goodness is the word, that spreading of the word. But of course, as we said, it's hard. It's hard because one, I receive it, and so therefore it's going to be limited to my perceptions. So some people will be more talented at how they can be able to communicate the gospel, and others will be less. But everyone can live the gospel and be that living message in the first place. That's our first and fundamental requirement. It's not that we all become teachers or catechists, but our lives have to be a catechism in the way that we live, the way that we speak, the way that we act, the things that we do, the communications we give. And everyone, even the most ignorant person on the face of the earth can do that. That's why no one will escape the day of judgment. Because we receive a treasure, we have to transmute this at least into the actions so that these be seen. And in fact, oftentimes, it's in our husoyo for confessors that God sent teachers to the church. And even if not in words, by example and the actions of them, they spread the gospel and spread what is truth. So that is the first thing. There will be an obscurity on this part. For us to be able to communicate is why the famous axiom we have to teach us to learn twice. To teach us to learn twice means that if I can't communicate it, it doesn't actually mean that I really know it. It's the stammering of the middle school kid. Well, yeah, 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 check, yeah. The answer, I have the answer to question eight. I know what it is. Well, we're waiting. Well, well, it's like, um, um, um. Now we all have that experience. If not on the, if not on the giving end of um, 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 on the receiving end, like waiting, okay. And that is why in the communication that we give, it means that it has to be clarified already in what we're actually trying to say. That is all on the objective level of the faith. That's the knowledge of our catechism. You know, amongst Catholics, we just say, it's the knowledge of the catechism. It's the knowledge of what the church's actual teaching is. And to learn it that way. And of course, it has to be made more profound as our lives go on. 
My knowledge at the age of 10 is not sufficient when I'm 70, any more than acting like a 10-year-old is going to be ever acceptable at the age of 70, though perhaps we do know 70-year-olds who do act like they're 10. But this aspect of deepening the faith is the, the first thing. That's the person who has received the gospel. But it's also hard because to communicate requires two things. First of all, is the charity and the desire to do so. Share, 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 share. The desire to share comes from charity. And the person who is inflamed with the gospel always has a desire to communicate. They may not be able to communicate to the fullest extent for various reasons, not only on their part in the communication abilities, but also on the part of the recipient. Everyone's free. Everyone's free and everyone's able to hear or not hear or listen or not listen or to choose and not choose, to receive or to reject. It is the freedom of grace, right? He came unto his own and his own received him not. When the Messiah appears among Israel, he's dealing with the people that he has worked with for 1,500 years and they still don't receive him. So our little friendships of life that we have that go on for a few years, perhaps a few decades sometimes, we shouldn't be surprised when the things that we communicate aren't always received because there's freedom. And so that is actually the second aspect which is difficult, is that everyone has their own baggage. Everyone has their own difficulties in life. So when I say communicate, it doesn't mean communicate to just simply try to ram the catechism into somebody else's head. That doesn't work either. We can know actually the faith very well, be able to articulate it very well, and have it call, fall completely on its face every time we're in contact with someone. Because the second aspect of communication is the condition of the person to whom we are speaking, to whom we are communicating. So that the way that a teacher will talk about geography to sixth graders is not going to be the same way they're going to talk about geography to seniors in high school or graduate students. You're always going to have the same material be communicated in various ways, not because the material changes, but because they're only disposed and able to receive at that point that aspect. These are clarities and distinctions that we have to keep in mind. Because in the modern world, in this kind of just this mush of lack of clarity of thinking, we have all of this screaming at each other, even within the church. You can't do that, that's harsh. They won't receive, you're not welcoming, you're not this, you're not that, you're too much. There is a distinction to be made that the objectivity of the word made flesh and the objectivity of our faith is very clear. If anything, the church throughout the centuries has been despised for her desire and her mission to articulate clearly the revelation of God. Can't you just leave it ambiguous and then we'll all be happy? Because then we can all interpret it the way we want. It's like that's never been the Catholic Church, never. But to the degree that in the last 60 years we've become, well, we use the term mealy mouth. It's just kind of like mush comes out. Then, of course, it all becomes confusing. It becomes confusing to those who want to receive the revelation of God because it's like, well, it's this, sort of. I say, wait a minute. It's either the revelation of God or it's not. It's either the gospel or it's not. And that lack of clarity is what causes part of the confusion. But it's also within the confusion that allows it not to be received because everyone's receiving it in their own way of making it up. That's the, well, I'm spiritual but not religious crowd. And so when we look at the gospel, there are two aspects that we have to always be kept in mind. Is that objectivity. There is a catechism. There is an official teaching of the church. But the communication of that gospel to others requires that we in our charity communicate it to them where they are at and to the capacity that they are able to receive it. But that charity and that act of communicating to this individual or to this handful of people 
is an act of charity. It's not meant to be the transformation of the gospel so that we may deal with people who are in a bad situation in life. They're in their third quote-unquote marriage, which of course is not their third marriage. They're with the third person that they're living with, civil or not married. They're not married. Their first marriage is still there, etc. You know the story. And we all have them in our families. It doesn't mean you slam into them and every time you see them you have to repeat the church's doctrine. But it also does not mean that because charity requires me to communicate to them from where they're at, that I mutilate the gospel and confuse the message of revelation. Their situation is very clear. Their situation is objective. Their situation is concrete the way it is. So there are three things for us to take away from the consideration of this first chapter of St. John is one is the objectivity of the word made flesh. God radiates in light. It is denho, it is epiphany. That with St. John, we see that there is an obscurity in which the human mind will receive this revelation, not the church, but the individual human mind. And that that message is passed to others and in passing to others, there are the two things to remember. One is the objective teaching of the church. Charity for others does not and cannot obscure that objective message. But how we communicate this message, and you may inevitably find with this person in their third domestic partner or in the same-sex relationship family, whatever you want to call these things because this is the world we live in now, you may find that at some point, no matter how charitable you've been, they're still going to reject it because they know the punchline. They know what the doctrine is. But you cannot obscure the doctrine for an idea of what ultimately is a falsified compassion, a falsified charity. And so when we deal with people, all of that is hard. I know, it's been my career for over 30 years to deal with people who everyone, we all have baggage. But in dealing with it, you have the ability in a concrete situation to share in charity and compassion. It is possible. It does not mean it will be successful, but it is possible. And when it comes to that aspect of whether they engage or not with the gospel that you communicate to them, that is their freedom to respond to grace or not. And so this testimony that St. John has held up for us is the important thing for us always to keep the clarity of objectivity and the concrete case in which I'm working with and communicating to this colleague, to this family member, to this fellow student, or whoever it may be, that my compassion cannot allow me to obscure the doctrine. Because if I obscure the doctrine at the moment they make progress, I've actually not given them anything. Because what I have communicated them was a mutilation of the doctrine. And that will be explosive. I worked in a marriage case once where between the two individuals, the woman who was entering the church was brilliant, one of the most brilliant women I have ever met. And catechizing her was, was a real joy. I mean, she just absorbed everything. But her fiancé, cradle Catholic, her fiancé was not faithful. And they were fornicating before their marriage. Now her, I was teaching the catechism, but him I was calling aside and saying, look, you can't be doing this. Oh, you know, it's so hard, Father. It's so, yeah, I understand. It's called temptation. But I told him, if you do not start acting according to the faith that you're professing, you're very proud that she's coming in the church. I got one. You are going to destroy her. She had been, she, coming from a non-baptized background, her life was, was extraordinarily complicated. And she already had two daughters from other relationships. And this was a moment in which the balm of God was clearly coming, not only to this woman, but to her teenage children. Middle school. Yeah, middle school, late elementary. And they were observing, they were just as smart, these two girls, as their mother was. And they're absorbing it all, and I'm watching the flock. I'm watching this member, this one cradle Catholic, screwing it all up because he can't control himself. 
And he's fornicating with her before the marriage. And I said, you must understand that if you continue to do this, you're going to. I have no idea what, but this is going to blow up. And you may be thinking, well, the marriage didn't go through. No, they got married. But as she continued to actually understand the faith, you start living it. It starts becoming deeper. It's one thing to be sitting with the priest in the office and going over the doctrine, explaining how it works together, what's here, what's revelation, how does it flow, what is life of virtue. It's one thing to actually hear it all. But as you begin to live it, then it takes on a true meaning. It becomes life And as she entered more deeply into the faith, she began to realize we were fornicating. She knew that, obviously, before she got married. But the second year, living as a Catholic, the third year, it made it to the third year. But as she truly came to understand what the sacraments were and the life of Christ was within the church and living that faith, she began to realize that this man that she's married had, no matter how much blubbering and giving of gifts and taking her to dinner, was condemning her to hell by his actions of fornication before they got married. And it's exactly what I told them was going to happen. When she understood that this profession of love, which was coupled together with mortal sin, she blew up because she was smart, because she was intelligent, and she looked at him in a totally different light. And no matter how much I tried to save the relation, it did not work. Because all she could see was a man who in that condition was not being compassionate, was not being caring because having sex outside of marriage, no matter what we blubber on about in the modern world. She came to realize this man was disposed to lead me into mortal sin, damning my soul to hell while professing over a dinner table how much he loved me and wanted to marry me. She saw the logic. If God gave us 10% of Catholics who use the logic of this new Catholic, the world would be transfigured. But needless to say, it blew up. It exploded. And he stood there in that emasculated, modern way of just blubbering because he's losing his family. And it's like, you knew this four years ago. This is your fault. You corrupted them in the communication of the gospel. You satisfied your own lust. And in the end, you have remotely prepared to this destruction that you now live. So it was a hard lesson. And he never really recovered from it. And those those three brilliant women, they left the parish. They were gone because they'd only been Catholic for 30 months. Everyone is free. We have to show charity, we have to show compassion, but we must live integrity. Integrity means the wholeness of that gospel message, the wholeness of the faith when we communicate it. So may St. John the Baptist intercede for us, a man who had such integrity, communicating and witnessing to this is the Son of God, that in the end his head was cut off for it. Are we ready to walk the same path? That is a message of epiphany. So we ask for his intercession to give us courage, to give us strength of grace, because without grace, we have no ability to do this. But in doing so with courage, that come what may, we bring the gospel in its objectivity, we couch it in charitable terms for the individual of where they're at, but always leading them deeper into the life, not obscuring it by our sins, not obscuring it by our confusion, but by bringing them truly to the gospel, which by its being a message is not only received, but in communicating brings life. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen.
תלוות מדב הידע לחוף, על ועצה לחוד עם חדי ציות, ואין מסגות עיבותו, כיול על בית תוך וסגוד עם חייב לו, עוד כהוד השוחם. Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the blessed mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the chosen one, our holy father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Eustratius. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. O 
God, the Father, lover of all people, though we are unworthy, make us worthy of salvation, purified of deceit and hypocrisy, and united in a bond of love and peace. Through our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may we give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. <clears throat> Merciful Lord, you dwell on high, and you look down upon the earth. Through the grace of your only Son, send your blessings upon those who bow before your holy altar. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. God the Father, in your love for all people, you sent your Son into the world to bring the lost sheep back to you. Do not turn your holy face away from us as we celebrate this spiritual and bloodless sacrifice. Relying on your mercy and through the grace of your only Son, we ask that this mystery, instituted for our salvation, not be for our condemnation, Rather, may it blot out all our sins, forgive our faults, and be an expression of our thanks for your goodness. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify you, bless you, praise you, adore you, and give you things, O Maker of all things, visible and invisible. The highest heavens and all its powers praise you, the sun, the moon, and all the stars, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. The angels, archangels, and the heavenly host all sing, praising your majestic glory with triumphant hymns, with never-ending voices and with sweet acclamations. They cry out and they proclaim.
benediction. Kudire eleison, wabiamo haudatum rashodi lema bedhaye, and sabe lahmamida kodi shoto, upare hukodesh. Waksu yam bin talmida karomaram, sabe hula mehne kulhun, hunu denita. Fahrodil, Dachlo Faikun, Wachlov Sagiem, Metachaseo Metiheb, Husoyon, Homewa Hoye, Dalam Alamin. So dann sich vor mein Hamro mein Mayo. Barechu Kodesh. O ja, wir tal mit au Karomar. Sabesh tawa mehne kulchun. Hono denita. Demondilan diantiki khadato. Dachlo Faikun, Wachlov Sagie, Teshadu Metiheb, Husunion, Hambewa Hoye, Dan Rayam Alamin. Amen. Do this in memory of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death and profess my resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O oh Lord, we remember your death, your resurrection, your ascension into heaven. You are sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your glory is second coming, when you shall judge the world with justice and reward all people according to their deeds. Now we ask you, do not repay us according to our sins and transgressions, but in your compassion and love for all people, cleanse us of all our sins. We, your people and your inheritance, implore you and through you and with you, implore your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us, and hear us. Now awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Annin morio, annin morio, annin morio, ni temor rojo chayu kodisho, onachen alainu aru korbono, Sense he may make this bread a life giving body, a saving body, a heavenly body, a body that redeems our souls and bodies, a body of the Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life for those who receive it. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of the new covenant, a life giving blood, a saving blood, a heavenly blood, a blood that redeems our souls and bodies, 
the blood of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life for those who receive it. May these holy mysteries be for the sanctification of the souls and bodies of those who share in them, that they may excel in all good deeds. May they be for the strengthening of your holy church, which you have founded upon the rock of faith, so that the gates of Sheol shall not prevail against her, delivering her from all heresies and doubts until the end of time and forever. We offer you, O Lord, the sacrifice for your holy church throughout the world and for the holy places that you have glorified by the presence of Christ your Son, especially for Zion, Jerusalem, mother of all the churches. Remember our pure bishops who spread the word of truth, especially our blessed fathers, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the orders of the church and those who serve her. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our parents and all our brothers and sisters, those who are here praying with us, those who are not here, and those who have asked us to remember them in our prayers. Answer the, the, answer the petitions that will lead to their salvation. Remember those who have presented offerings upon your holy altar, those for whom they have been offered, those who have desired to make an offering but were unable, those whom we have remembered, and those whom we have not. Reward them with the joy of your salvation and accept their offering upon your heavenly altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders, and clothe them in your fear, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. Remember also captives and prisoners, the sick, the suffering, and the afflicted, the needy, and those who labor in all walks of life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, the holy and glorious ever Virgin Mary, the patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, St. John, the forerunner, St. Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, St. James, the brother of the Lord, St. Joseph, St. Jude, and all the saints. In your grace, count us among them in the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, the fathers and teachers who spread the word of truth in your holy church and preached your Son, Jesus Christ, to all nations. Through their prayers, grant peace to your church and confirm their teachings in our souls. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O oh God, of all spiritual and earthly beings, the faithful departed who have died in the true faith. Grant them rest and do not take their faults into account. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever.
pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you, to you be glory forever. O God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all consolation, you have sanctified the offerings and gifts presented to you and have perfected them by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O Holy Father, God of heaven, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O Lord, our God, lead us not into temptation that we do not have the strength to endure. But when we are tempted, deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el Kolukhunna. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, we bow our heads before you, awaiting your abundant mercy. Send your blessings upon us and sanctify us, so that we may become worthy to share in your holy mysteries through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his mercy and his love for all people. You are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
begin, we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, the passion and the mercy of the one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Thank you, O God, the Father, for your great and indescribable love for all people. Since you have made us worthy to share in your heavenly banquet and in your Holy Spirit, do not forsake us for having received your holy mysteries, but keep us in the radiance of holiness and righteousness. With the saints, may we obtain a share in the heavenly reward through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el-Kuluchun. Amen. Oh, Jesus, our Lord, bless us, protect us, and guide us on the path of life. Favorably remember the departed 
those who have shared in this Eucharist that was offered upon this divine altar. Grant protection to the living and bless them with hope through the prayers of the Virgin Mary and all the saints, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.